disrupt the framework of the essay, that they take up too much space, so that the rest of its subject matter, with which they are not always closely connected, is pushed to one side. This may have spoiled the structure of my paper, but it corresponds faithfully to my intention to represent the sense of guilt as the most important problem in the development of civilization and to show that the price we pay for our advance in civilization is a loss of happiness through the heightening of the sense of guilt. Anything that still sounds strange about this statement, which is the final conclusion of our investigation, can probably be traced to the quite peculiar relationship, as yet completely unexplained, which the sense of guilt has to our consciousness. In the common sense of remorse, which we regard as normal, this feeling makes itself clearly enough perceptible to consciousness. Indeed, we are accustomed to speak of a consciousness of guilt instead of a sense of guilt. Our study of the neurosis, to which after all we owe the most valuable pointers to an understanding of normal conditions, brings us up against some contradictions. In one of those affections, obsessional neurosis, the sense of guilt makes itself noisily heard in consciousness. It dominates the clinical picture and the patient's life as well. And it hardly allows anything else to appear alongside of it. But in most other cases and forms of neurosis, it remains completely unconscious without, on that account, producing any less important effects. Our patients do not believe us when we attribute an unconscious sense of guilt to them. In order to make ourselves at all intelligible to them, we tell them, tell them of an unconscious need for punishment in which the sense of guilt finds expression. But its connection with a particular form of neurosis must not be overestimated. Even in obsessional neurosis, there are types of patients who are not aware of their sense of guilt or who only feel it as a tormenting uneasiness, a kind of anxiety, if they are prevented from carrying out certain actions. It ought to be possible eventually to understand these things, but as yet we cannot. Here, perhaps, we may be glad to have it pointed out that the sense of guilt is at bottom nothing else but a topographical variety of anxiety. In its later phases, it coincides completely with fear of the superego, and the relations of anxiety to consciousness exhibit the same extraordinary variations. Anxiety is always present somewhere or other behind every symptom, but at one time it takes noisy possession of the whole of consciousness, while at another it conceals itself so completely that we are obliged to speak of unconscious anxiety, or, if we want to have a clearer psychological conscience, since anxiety is the first instance simply a feeling of possibilities of anxiety. Consequently, it is very conceivable that the sense of guilt produced by civilization is not perceived as such either, and remains to a large extent unconscious or appears as a sort of malaise, a dissatisfaction for which people seek other motivations. Religions, at any rate, have never overlooked the part played in civilization by a sense of guilt. Furthermore, a point which I fail to appreciate elsewhere, they claim to redeem mankind from this sense of guilt, which they call sin. From the manner in which, in Christianity, this redemption is achieved by the sacrificial death of a single person who in this manner takes upon himself a guilt that is common to everyone. We have been able to infer what the first occasion may have been on which this primal guilt, which was also the beginning of civilization, was acquired.
cannot be of great importance, it may not be superfluous to elucidate the meaning of a few words such as superego, conscience, sense of guilt, need for punishment, and remorse, which we have often perhaps used too loosely and interchangeably. They all relate to the same state of affairs, but denote different aspects of it. The superego is an agency which has been inferred by us, and conscience is a function which we ascribe, among other functions, to that agency. This function consists in keeping a watch over the actions and intentions of the ego and judging them, in exercising a censorship. The sense of guilt, the harshness of the superego, is thus the same thing as the severity of the conscience. It is the perception which the ego has of being watched over in this way, the assessment of the tension between its own strivings and the demands of the superego. The fear of this critical agency, a fear which is at the bottom of the whole relationship, the need for punishment, is an instinctual manifestation on the part of the ego, which has become masochistic under the influence of a sadistic superego. It is a portion, that is to say, of the instinct towards internal destruction present in the ego, employed for forming an erotic attachment to the superego. We ought not to speak of a conscience until a superego is demonstrably present. As to a sense of guilt, we must admit that it is in existence before the superego, and therefore before conscience too. At that time, it is the immediate expression of fear of the external authority, a recognition of the tension between the ego and that authority. It is the direct derivative of the conflict between the need for the authority's love and the urge towards instinctual satisfaction, whose inhibition produces the inclination to aggression. The superimposition of these two strata of the sense of guilt, one coming from fear of the external authority, the other from fear of the internal authority, has hampered our insight into the position of conscience in a number of ways. Remorse is a general term for the ego's reaction in a case of sense of guilt. It contains, in little altered form, the sensory material of the anxiety which is operating behind the sense of guilt. It is itself a punishment and can include the need for punishment. Thus, remorse, too, can be older than conscience. Nor will it do any harm if we once more review the contradictions which have for a while perplexed us during our inquiry. Thus, at one point the sense of guilt was the consequence of acts of aggression that had been abstained from, but at another point, and precisely at its historical beginning, the killing of the father, it was the consequence of an act of aggression that had been carried out. But a way out of this difficulty was found. For the institution of the internal authority, the superego, altered the situation radically. Before this, the sense of guilt coincided with remorse. We may remark, incidentally, that the term remorse should be reserved for the reaction after an act of aggression has actually been carried out. After this, owing to the omniscience of the superego, the difference between an aggression intended and an aggression carried out lost its force. Henceforward, a sense of guilt could be produced not only by an act of violence that is actually carried out, as all the world knows, but also by one that is merely intended, as psychoanalysis has discovered. Irrespectively of this alteration in the psychological situation, the conflict arising from ambivalence, the conflict between the two primal instincts, leaves the same result behind. We are tempted to look here for the solution of the problem of the varying relation in which the sense of guilt stands to consciousness. It might be thought that a sense of guilt arising from remorse for an evil deed must always be conscious, whereas a sense of guilt arising from the perception of an evil impulse may remain unconscious. But the answer is not so simple as that. Obsessional neurosis speaks energetically against it. The second contradiction concerned the aggressive energy with which we suppose the superego to be endowed. According to one view, that energy merely carries on the punitive energy of the external authority and keeps it alive in the mind. 
while according to another view, it consists, on the contrary, of one's own aggressive energy, which has not been used and which one now directs against that inhibiting authority. The first view seemed to fit in better with the history, and the second with the theory of the sense of guilt. Closer reflection has resolved this apparently irreconcilable contradiction almost too completely. What remained as the essential and common factor was that in each case we were dealing with an aggressiveness which had been displaced inwards. Clinical observation, moreover, allows us, in fact, to distinguish two sources for the aggressiveness which we attribute to the superego. One or the other of them exercises the stronger effect in any given case, but as a general rule, they operate in unison. This is, I think, the place at which to put forward for serious consideration a view which I have earlier recommended for provisional acceptance. In the most recent analytic literature, a predilection is shown for the idea that any kind of frustration, any thwarted instinctual satisfaction results or may result in a heightening of the sense of guilt. A great theoretical simplification will, I think, be achieved if we regard this as applying only to the aggressive instincts. And little will be found to contradict this assumption. For how are we to account on dynamic and economic grounds for an increase in the sense of guilt appearing in place of an unfulfilled erotic demand? This only seems possible in a roundabout way. If we suppose, that is, that the prevention of an erotic satisfaction calls up a piece of aggressiveness against the person who has interfered with the satisfaction, and that this aggressiveness has itself to be suppressed in turn. But if this is so, it is, after all, only the aggressiveness which is transformed into a sense of guilt by being suppressed and made over to the superego. I am convinced that many processes will admit of a simpler and clearer exposition if the findings of psychoanalysis with regard to the derivation of the sense of guilt are restricted to the aggressive instincts. Examination of the clinical material gives us no unequivocal answer here because, as our hypotheses tell us, the two classes of instincts hardly ever appear in a pure form, isolated from each other. But an investigation of extreme cases would probably po point in the direction I anticipate. I am tempted to extract a first advantage from this more restrictive view of the case by applying it to the process of repression. As we have learned, neurotic symptoms are, in their essence, substitutive satisfactions for unfulfilled sexual wishes. In the course of our analytic work, we have discovered, to our surprise, that perhaps every neurosis conceals a quota of unconscious sense of guilt, which in its turn fortifies the symptoms by making use of them as a punishment. It now seems plausible to formulate the following proposition. When an instinctual 
trend undergoes a repression. Its libidinal elements are turned into symptoms and its aggressive components into a sense of guilt. Even if this proposition is only an average approximation to the truth, it is worth and worthy of our interest. Some readers of this work may further have an impression that they have heard the formula of the struggle between Eris and the death instinct too often. It was alleged to characterize the process of civilization, which mankind undergoes, but it was also brought into connection with the development of the individual. And in addition, it was said to have revealed the secret of organic life in general. We cannot, I think, avoid going into the relations of these three processes to one another. Repetition of the same formula is justified by the consideration that both the process of human civilization and of the development of the individual are also vital processes, which is to say that they must share in the most general characteristic of life. <coughs> On the other hand, evidence of the presence of this general characteristic fails for the very reason of its general nature to help us to arrive at any differentiation between the process or the processes so long as it is not narrowed down by special qualifications. We can only be satisfied, therefore, if we assert that the process of civilization is, is a modification which the vital process experiences under the influence of a task that is set it by Eros and instigated by Ananke, by the exegesis of reality. And that this task is one of uniting separate individuals into a community bound together by libidinal ties. When, however, we look at the relation between the process of human civilization and the development or educative process of individual human beings, we shall conclude without much hesitation that the two are very similar in nature, if not the very same process applied to different kinds of objects. The process of the civilization of the human species is, of course, an abstraction of a higher order that is the development of the individual and it is therefore harder to apprehend in concrete terms. Nor should we pursue analogies to an obsessional extreme. But in view of the similarity between the aims of the two processes, in the one case, the integration of a separate individual into a human group, and in the other case, the creation of a unified group out of many individuals, we cannot be surprised at the similarity between the means employed and the resultant phenomenon. In view of its exceptional importance, we must not long postpone the mention of one feature which distinguishes between the two processes.
in the developmental process of the individual, the program of the pleasure principle, which consists in finding the satisfaction of happiness, is retained as the main aim. Integration in, or adaptation to, a human community appears as a scarcely avoidable condition which must be fulfilled before this aim of happiness can be achieved. If it could be done without that condition, it would perhaps be preferable. To put it in other words, the development of the individual seems to us to be the product of the interaction between two urges. The urge toward happiness, which we usually call egoistic, and the urge toward union with others in the community, which we call altruistic. Neither of these descriptions goes much below the surface. In the process of individual development, as we have said, the main accent falls mostly on the egoistic urge or the urge toward happiness, while the other urge, which may be described as a cultural one, is usually content with the role of imposing restrictions. But in the process of civilization, things are different. Here by far, the most important thing is the aim of creating a unity out of the individual human beings. It is true that the aim of happiness is still there, but it is pushed into the background. It almost seems as if the creation of a great human community would be most successful if no attention had to be paid to the happiness of the individual. The developmental process of the individual can thus be expected to have special features of its own, which are not reproduced in the process of human civilization. It is only insofar as the first of these processes has union with the community as its aim that it need coincide with the second process. Just as a planet revolves around a central body, as well as rotating on its own axis, so the human individual takes part in the course of development of mankind at the same time as he pursues his own path in life. But to our dull eyes, the play of forces in the heavens seems fixed in a never-changing order. In the field of organic life, we can still see how the forces contend with one another and how the effects of the conflict are continually changing. So also the two urges, the one toward personal happiness and the other toward union with other human beings, must struggle with each other in every individual. And so also the two processes of individual and cultural development must stand in hostile opposition to each other and mutually dispute the ground. But this struggle between the individual and society is not derivative of the contradiction, perhaps an irreconcilable one, between the primal instincts of eros and death. It is a dispute within the economics of the libido, comparable to the contest concerning the distribution of libido between ego and objects. And it does admit of an eventual accommodation in the individual, as it may be hoped it will also do in the future of civilization however much that civilization may oppress the life of the individual today. The analogy between the process of civilization and the path of individual development may be extended in an important respect. It can be asserted that the community, too, evolves a superego under whose influence cultural development proceeds. It would be a tempting task for anyone who has a knowledge of human civilizations to follow out this analogy in detail. I will confine myself to bringing forward a few striking points. The superego of an epoch of civilization has an origin similar to that of an individual. It's based on the impression left behind by the personalities of great leaders, men of overwhelming force of mind, or men in whom one of the human impulsions has found its strongest and purest, and therefore often its most one-sided expression. In many instances, the analogy goes still further, in that during their lifetime, these figures were, often enough, even if, if not always, mocked and maltreated by others, and even dispatched in a cruel fashion. In the same way, indeed, the primal father did not attain divinity until long after he had met his death by violence. The most arresting example of this fateful conjunction is to be seen in the figure of Jesus Christ. If indeed that figure is not a part of mythology which called it into being from an obscure memory of that primal event. Another point of agreement 
between the cultural and the individual superego is that the former, just like the latter, sets up strict ideal demands, disobedience to which is visited with fear of conscience. Here, indeed, we come across the remarkable circumstance that the mental processes concerned are actually more familiar to us and more accessible to consciousness as they are seen in the group than they can be in the individual man. In him, when tension arises, it's only the aggressiveness of the superego which, in the form of reproaches, makes itself noisily heard. Its actual demands often remain unconscious in the background. If we bring them to conscious knowledge, we find that they coincide with the precepts of the prevailing cultural superego. At this point, the two processes, that of the cultural development of the group and the cultural development of the individual, are, as it were, always interlocked. For that reason, some of the manifestations and properties of the superego can be more easily detected in its behavior in the cultural community than in the separate individual. <laughs> the cultural superego has developed its ideals and set up its demands, and among the latter, those which deal with the relations of human beings to one another are comprised under the heading of ethics. People have at all times set the greatest value on ethics, as though they expected that it in particular would produce especially important results. And it does, in fact, deal with a subject which can easily be recognized as the sorest spot in every civilization. Ethics is thus to be regarded as a therapeutic attempt as an endeavor to achieve by means of a command of the superego, something which has so far not been achieved by means of any other cultural activities. As we already know, the problem before us is how to get rid of the greatest hindrance to civilization, namely the constitutional inclination of human beings to be aggressive towards one another. And for that very reason, we are especially interested in what is probably the most recent of the cultural commands of the superego, the commandment to love one's neighbor as oneself. In our research into and the therapy of a neurosis, we're led to make two reproaches against the superego of the individual. In the severity of its commands and prohibitions, it troubles itself too little about the happiness of the ego, in that it takes insufficient account of the resistances against obeying them, of the instinctual strength of the id in the first place, and of the difficulties presented by the real external environment in the second. Consequently, we're very often obliged for therapeutic purposes to oppose the superego, and we endeavor to lower its demands. Exactly the same expectations, objections, can be made against the ethical demands of the cultural superego. It, too, does not trouble itself en enough about the facts of the mental constitution of human beings. It issues a command. It does not ask whether it's possible for people to obey it. On the contrary, it assumes that a man's ego is psychologically capable of anything that's required of it, that his ego has unlimited mastery over his id. This is a mistake. And even in what are known as normal people, the id cannot be controlled beyond certain limits. If more is demanded of a man, a revolt will be produced in him, or a neurosis, and he'll be made unhappy. The commandment, love thy neighbor as thyself, is the strongest defense against human aggressiveness and an excellent example of the unpsychological proceedings of the cultural superego. The commandment is impossible to fulfill. Such an enormous inflation of love can only lower its value, not get rid of the difficulty. Civilization pays no attention to all this. It merely admonishes us that the harder it is to obey the precept, the more meritorious it is to do so. But anyone who follows such a precept in present-day civilization only puts himself at a disadvantage vis-a-vis -vis the person who disregards it. What a potent obstacle to civilization aggressiveness must be if the defense against it can cause as much unhappiness as aggressiveness itself. Natural ethics, as it is called, has nothing to offer here except the narcissistic satisfaction of being able to think oneself better than others. At this point, the ethics based on religion introduces its promises of a better afterlife. But so long as virtue is not rewarded here on earth,
Ethics will, I fancy, preach in vain. I, too, think it quite certain that a real change in the relations of human beings to possessions would be of more help in this direction than any ethical commandments. But the recognition of this fact among socialists has been obscured and made useless for practical purposes by a fresh idealistic misconception of human nature. I believe the line of thought which seeks to trace the phenomenon of cultural development, the part played by superego, promises still further discoveries. I hasten to come to a close. But there's one question which I can hardly evade. If the development of civilization has such a far-reaching similarity to the development of the individual, and if it employs the same methods, may we not be justified in reaching the diagnosis that under the influence of cultural urges, some civilizations or some epochs of civilization, possibly the whole of mankind, have become neurotic. An analytic di dissection of such neuroses might lead to therapeutic recommendations which could lay claim to great practical interest. I would not say that such an attempt of this kind to carry psychoanalysis over to the cultural community was absurd or doomed to be fruitless. But we should have to be very cautious. Do not forget that, after all, we are only dealing with analogies, <clears throat> and that it's dangerous, not only with men, but also with, also with concepts, to tear them from the sphere in which they've originated and have evolved. And moreover, the diagnosis of communal neuroses is faced with a special difficulty. In an individual neurosis, we take as our starting point the contrast that distinguishes the patient from his environment, which is assumed to be normal. For a group, all of whose members are affected by one and the same disorder, no such background could exist. It would have to be found elsewhere. And as regards the therapeutic application of our knowledge, what would be the use of the most correct analysis of social neuroses, since no one possesses authority to impose such a therapy upon the group? But in spite of all these difficulties, we may expect that one day someone will venture to impart upon a pathology of cultural communities. For a wide variety of reasons, it is very far from my intention to express an opinion upon the value of human civilization. I have endeavored to guard myself against the enthusiastic prejudice which holds that our civilization is the most precious thing that we possess or could acquire, and that its path will necessarily lead to heights of unimagined perfection. I can at least listen without indignation to the critic who is of the opinion that when one surveys the aims of cultural endeavor and the means it employs, one is bound to come to the conclusion that the whole effort is not worth the trouble, and that the outcome of it can only be a state of affairs which the individual will be unable to tolerate. My impartiality is made all the easier to me by my knowing very little about all these things. One thing only do I know for certain and that is that man's judgments of value follow directly his wishes for happiness, that accordingly they are an attempt to support his illusions with arguments. I should find it very understandable if someone were to point out the obligatory nature of the course of human civilization and were to say, for instance, that the tendencies to a restriction of sexual life or to the institution of a humanitarian ideal at the expense of natural selection or developmental trends which cannot be averted or turned aside and to which it is best for us to yield as though they were necessities of nature. I know too the objection that can be made against this to the effect that In the history of mankind, trends such as these, which were considered unsurmountable, have often been thrown aside and replaced by other trends. Thus, I have not the courage 
to rise up before my fellow men as a prophet. And I bow to their reproach that I can offer them no consolation. For at bottom, that is what they are all demanding. The wildest revolutionaries no less passionately than the most virtuous believers. The fateful question for the human species seems to me to be whether and to what extent their cultural development will succeed in mastering the disturbance of their communal life by the human instinct of aggression and self-destruction. It may be that in this respect, precisely the present time deserves a special interest. Men have gained control over the forces of nature to such an extent that with their help, they would have no difficulty in exterminating one another to the last man. They know this, and hence comes a large part of their current unrest, their unhappiness, and their mood of anxiety. And now it is to be expected that the other of the two heavenly powers, eternal Eros, will make an effort to assert himself in the struggle with his equally immortal adversary. But who can foresee with what success and what result? Thank you.